It's a real pleasure to see my, this youngster get to be 60. <laughs> now I can do, say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it seems to be contagious among my friends to get to be 60. <laughs> <laughs> So I try to remember, and in fact, I, I did find, yesterday I was chatting with Pierre Picot, with Véronique, and I did find when the, the path intersected. It was in, no, I think it was in 94 in Berlin, in the, in the, no, in the, ah, in the same with uh, yeah, Flora QQ. Thing. The, the, the the no, 92, no, come on, 92, uh, it was just starting. Anyway, yeah. some, sometime then. And uh, since then, of course, we, we've been friends, we've worked together. Has been a long time now that we haven't really worked together, but uh, we could do that again. So I had left a little bit the, the spin glass thing, but recently there was progress, and I want to describe work, joint work with uh, Eliran Subag. who is now at Courant after his PhD at uh, Weizmann and offers a Tuni, whom everybody knows, and he's also at Weizmann and Courant. And in fact, the, this, this grew out of uh, an older work from uh, maybe six years ago or something with uh, Tuka, uh, Finger, myself, and Yirji Czerny, who is here, and Yirji, forgive me, I, for, I keep forgetting the... <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this was a long time ago now, in, I think published in 13, there were two papers, one with Tuka and Yirji, and one just with Tuka. And this introduced something which has then been developed by Eliran in his PhD, so in, there's a bunch of papers by, by Eliran in 15, 16, and more recently, Eliran and uh, Ofer, and then Eliran Ofer and myself. And even more recently, I learned la just last week uh, of uh, uh, a very recent work, which I think is not yet maybe posted by Eliran and Panchenko, pushing what, what, what I'm explaining here, which I think is important. So the idea is the following. We've heard about spinning glasses. Here I will talk about spherical spinning glasses, which is one version of them. And uh, so, of course, we know the story. The story is that you, Parisi told us 37 years ago that the important thing, so you want, you want to compute the free energy at positive temperature, you get the Parisi formula, which tells you that the important thing, the order parameter, is the distribution of the overlap, right? So you pick two replica, two points under the Gibbs measure, you look at their distance, essentially, the overlap is, or the, their inner product, and you look at the distribution of that. So it's an infinite dimensional order parameter, the distribution of this thing. And um, so that's for the description of the free energy, for the description of the Gibbs measure, uh, which, of course, a priori is not directly described by the, this very simple thing, which is just the distribution of the distance between two points, or the overlap between two points that you take under the Gibbs measure. The idea is that, of course, at a low temperature, you have ultrametricity and this ultrametric description, which, of course, has been pushed by, uh, mathematically, rigorously, by the introduction of the guerlain aguera uh, interpolation things, and then, of course, by Talagon and then by Penchenko. There are lots of results, but all, so all this is really based, and it's not that easy, of course, based on this idea that the that uh, the order parameter is the description of the Gibbs measure, is, is the right description of the Gibbs measure. And my view is that we don't have to adhere to that. We can just do something else. And so I want to explain the something else. The something else is the point of view, the naive point of view of a geometer. Forget about temperature, forget about all this. Why do I care about the, the uh, distribution of the overlap? I don't. I look at the, uh, just as a geometer, at the Hamiltonian itself as a function, no entropy, just the energy. 
It's a function on my, so let's say here on the sphere in high dimension, and I want to understand its complexity, how, uh, how it looks like. Once this is done in enough detail, uh, then maybe you can introduce a little bit of temperature and study now the, uh, the very low temperature regime directly and get a geometric understanding of what the Gibbs measure does. And in particular, try to understand what Irving was talking about, which is the tap states. He mentioned the tap equation, which is something else. The tap equations are, in fact, the equation giving the critical points of something which is called the tap free energy. And the belief, this is very much more controversial than the Parisi thing, but gives a much more detailed information about the Gibbs measure. And the way you introduce this step free energy is, in fact, perturbatively from infinite temperature, the Onzager correction. And, and then you have this step free energy, if you believe the physicists, and there, there was a long fight, right, which is not yet settled about what it is really. You compute the critical points of this thing, at high temperature, they are kind of accessible. And that's what Elvin was explaining. When you get to low temperature, and that's also what we heard in Francesco's talk, the, the, um, this tap, the critical points are supposed to be the tap states, which means this, the Gibbs measure is supposed to be decomposed into these things. And, but it's a strange thing. Think of it, constructing the tap free energy from a perturbation at infinite temperature and going down Okay, you could maybe start at zero temperature, right? And because you're interested in the low temperature regime. So that's what we try to do. So I will go very quickly on this, on the older results to go to get to what we do with uh, this geometric description with Edirand Subag and Ofarze Ituni. But let me, if you, so, and in some sense, we will introduce the right notion of tap states and what Penchenko and Edirand have been doing very, very recently is to show that this description, this new idea, which comes in fact from Eliran, um, also applies in the, uh, in the case of easing spins. Here I'm talking about spherical. In the case of easing spins, of course, talking about critical points of the Hamiltonian makes no sense. It's defined on a cube, on a discrete object. But the tap functional is in fact the function of a continuous variable in the solid cube. And the critical points of these things make sense. So this approach is also uh, applicable there, but I won't, I won't go there. You, you must uh, uh, look at this work. So anyway, so what are we looking at? So I will be, the whole thing will be on the spherical model. So I'm, the configuration will be on the sphere in n dimension of radius square root n, which I denote like this. And the Hamiltonian is, so let me first introduce the P-spin spherical model. It's just the usual thing. It's this. That's the classical normalization. So a P-spin interaction. And these guys are IID Gaussian. And you normalize them like that, all right? So what is that? It's sim a very simple thing. It's just simply, if you look at it as a geometer, it's just a random homogeneous polynomial of degree p. That's what it is. So not a very complex function. Of course, you could look at it as a Gaussian field. And, and the important thing, of course, is that it's, this one is centered. I would not add a magnetic field. And the covariance of this thing is, of course, the given by the piece power of the overlap. The overlap here being simply the inner product divided by n here. All right, divided by the product of the norms. So that's the p-spin Hamiltonian. And we will consider, so that's also the pure p-spin, if you want, spherical. And then you would, you can, we will consider general mixtures, which are more interesting. So you just look at this. So you take a family of, uh, you, you mix the different P's. So let's say you assume that the gamma P decreases exponentially fast, okay? Or you just maybe have a finite number of them. 
That's a well-defined Hamiltonian, that the mixed B spin, which is, of course, again, a Gaussian field. So now it's no longer a homogeneous polynomial. If you have a finite number of them, it's just a polynomial. And the covariance in this case is just, and, and you take these different guys independently, the covariance in this case is also a function of, uh, of the overlap. But now the function nu, which is called the mixture, nu of r, is just sum of gamma p square r to the p. OK? What? Oh, yeah, p. By the way, here's a remark. So this came in, in, since I want to take the point of view of the stubborn mathematician who doesn't want to know about. So this came into physics very naturally, of course. You see the gener okay, if you, if these guys are all if they're not random and you have two of them, that's Curie Weiss. Then you take them random and that's Sherrington Kirkpatrick. And Sherrington Kirkpatrick is not that good because you don't have in one RSB phase, you have no glass transition really. So you go to P models on the cube. And then the cube is too hard, so you go to the sphere. Right? So that's how this essentially appears. But in fact, you can forget all this. That's the only possible models you have. If you, if you take the point of view of mathematics, I want a Gaussian process on the sphere. Let's imagine you want a Gaussian field on the sphere such that the, let's say smooth, such that the um, covariance, which is isotropic, such that the covariance only dis depends on the distance, right? Which is, of course, what you see here. So this is the inner product, which, of course, is a function of the distance. So if you want a covariance which is just, these are just normalization, which is a function of the distance, so then this function here has to be, it's a covariance, so it has to be positive type. So you're asking yourself, what are the functions on the sphere which are positive type and only depending on the distance? This has been solved in 38 by Schoenberg. Didn't give a damn about spin glasses. And that's the only ones you have, right? So that's just studying isotropic fields on the sphere. That's all it is. And then now you can forget the word spin glass. All right, so I'm sorry? Which one? You mean this, this end? No, of course no. It was on the sphere of radius one. And in fact, he classified more. That is here, we say nu, and that's important to study anything, the thermodynamic limit. We want this nu to not change with n, because otherwise your model would be crazy if it changed at every n. But he told you, if you go to Schoenberg, he tells you what are the new n that are possible. And then they are more general than these. OK, so now that's the model. And of course, you want to understand, let's say, the, the free energy, the, the, the partition function. And the, the Gibbs measure first on the sphere is just exponential minus beta h, of course, n of sigma. d sigma, this is the uniform measure on the sphere, normalized. And this is the partition function. So of course, we know the Parisian approach would be to look at this as we've just heard, and try to understand the limit of this, and that the limit of that exists, and is, in fact, given by the Parisi formula, which I don't want to write. OK, so it's, in, uh, it's a variational problem in the space of, uh, of measures, which are the supposed to be the distribution of the overlap. All right, so, and then the next step, so this is, proven for generic models. The next step is to try to understand the structure of the Gibbs measure after this. And it's supposed to be interesting. You're supposed to have replica symmetry breaking and all that. All right, so, and in particular, so here's one question that I can state before saying anything about the structure of the Gibbs measure. First, I will, of course, describe things only in the case where the low temperature phase is one RSB. Because, in fact, for mixtures of spin glasses like that, spherical, you can have whatever you want. You can have, at low temperature, you can have one RSB, two RSB, full RSB, right? So we'll limit to the one RSB case. And um, so here is one question. It's about temperature chaos. So temperature chaos is supposed to be the following thing. If you take the Gibbs measure at two different temperature, do they see each other or not? Right? Do they have anything to do one with the other? You can put that in more mathematical terms. So in, if you pick a point under one Gibbs measure at temperature beta, another, a point from another Gibbs measure at temperature beta prime, even if beta prime is close to beta, 
Are these points kind of related or are they just random? So one way to look at that is to look, for instance, at their inner product. So if they are really completely not related, this inner product will be zero. If they are kind of closer, maybe this inner product will not be zero, right? So generically, it has been proven. Do you couple them in some way? No, not at all. No, no. You just take two points for the Gibbs measure at two different, very close temperature. Do that in easing model. And the, the same temperature, I'm sorry? No, that's no, completely wrong. Completely wrong. At low temperature, precisely because you have this phase transition, the distribution of the overlap, you look at this distribution at their distance, it's not zero. The fact that it is zero corresponds to replica symmetry. So on the contrary, and we will see, they are close. I mean, they can be close. Or, so now when you take two different temperatures, these, we will see, a priori, you expect there are general results, in particular by Penchenko, by Wei Kuo Chen, who's done that a lot, uh, saying that there is generically temperature, it should be temperature chaos. Not described very precisely, but some temperature chaos. The surprise came in 2016, I think, when Eliran Subag, using these results, proved that when you take the pure P spin, right, so this model, at very low temperature, there is no temperature chaos. So you can do what the physicists call state following. That if, if you look at this state decomposition of the Gibbs measure at very low temperature, you move the temperature a little bit, you can follow the states, right? So we want to understand this, and we will prove that generically, of course, we do have temperature chaos, and try to explain how it happens geometrically. And doing that introduced something which is probably the right, for me, the right version of what TAP, the TAP free energy should be, or the TAP states. Of course, since we write this, we refer a lot to the physics literature. We are prudent in not saying this is the right version of TAP states, but now I think I, I'm, uh, Filmed here. Friends. Yeah, except there's a camera up there, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let, let me start with this. So now I'm, I want to take the point of view a completely geometric point of view I don't care about the Gibbs measure yet. I just care about this function or that function, right? So the complexity Approach is very simple Completely it's purely a random geometry Right? You take this function, it's a smooth function in the sphere, a polynomial, a monomial, and you ask yourself how complex it is. As a geometer, you know how you describe a function, uh, the complexity of a function and a compact manifold. Uh, Morse theory told us how to do that, in, not even in 38, in 20 something. So you just count the number of critical points, and maybe you count the, you look, I don't know, at the earlier characteristic of the level sets or things of that nature. We can do all that. So one way to do that, let's, so let me take, take it, so you, you look at, let's say, the, I will take this notation, I take crit, which means number of critical points, K of B, that will be the number of critical points of my Hamiltonian on the sphere. Say here with, let's say, critical point say sigma, with the value h of sigma in B, and here I normalize, I will normalize by n, makes no difference. But. And here are the index of being k, the index of the, of the Hessian, if you will. So the index of the Hessian is just the number of negative eigenvalues, the number of directions going down. And, um, so here you say, how many critical points do I have at a given level, let's say B, and with a given index? And of course, you're interested mainly in index zero, right? That is the local minima. All right, and you could, you could go further. You could again, let's say, take the level set, or sub-level set, which of course is important for the Gibbs measure, and try to understand its topology by computing Betty numbers or, or the earlier characteristic, and these things are of course related by Morse inequalities, but let's forget that. So uh, the first thing you can, may want to do is to compute this. The first moment. So that's well known. I mean, this, there's a whole, this has been, so this also goes back to the 30s. Of course, not in this context. And it's called the Katz-Rice formula. So, in fact, Rice did it in the 30s, 
at the end of the 30s, the beginning of the 40s for, during the war. And Katz uh, generalized this just after the war. Rice did it in dimension one, right? So, and this, of course, we do that and now in a general manifold. And so there is a huge literature on this, which is, because that's a very important tool for statistics. And if you want two very good book, I love quoting that book because as Ais has been a, a friend of mine for 40 years. You have this book, which really, both of them are uh, 2007 or something, and both are statistician, and on the more probability point of view, you have this beautiful book by Adler and Taylor, and they are both essentially at the same time. So what is the cast rice formula telling you? It allows you to compute this, and this cast rice formula is just a dictionary between this problem of random geometry and a problem of random matrices. Right? At, at this point, there are no random matrices in a problem, but of course there is. And we'll see that. In fact, the cat's choice formula allows you to compute, and I shouldn't put a P here, any moment of this thing. Of course, it becomes less and less uh, practical, but you can do that. So let me tell you what the first moment looks like, or maybe, I don't know. Should I explain what the cat's choice formula is? Yeah. Oh, all right. So the cat's choice formula is, You integrate on the manifold, here the manifold is the sphere, then you integrate here on the set of values B, and then you have expectation, the conditional expectation of the absolute value, and that's the crucial thing, of the Hessian of the function here, H at sigma, in indicator of the index at sigma being K here, because I put that there. Um, Condition on the fact that the, the, grade, the point is critical and on the fact that the value is u. And then you integrate all this against the kernel phi of u uh, du d sigma. Oops. This guy is the density of the... Um, uh, or maybe I should just forget. Yeah. So this guy is the density of the distribution of the of the gradient uh, condition. I mean, uh, of the, let's say you take the couple h grad h and you condition by this being. So you, you should I should put a zero here and u. Okay. And this is the density. So that's just a Gaussian term, just a Gaussian density. That's easy. So when you look at this formula, and I forgot the second part here, the important thing is this term. And this term now, you have to compute the determinant of a Hessian condition, forget the index for the moment, conditioned by the gradient being zero and by, by the value, all right? But if you're in the Gaussian case, that's not hard because the triple H grad H and Hessian of H is a Gaussian thing, so this is just linear algebra. But now, what is this thing? So this thing now, under this conditioning, it's a random matrix, right? A real symmetric random matrix, right? So in the end, what you have to compute is be able to compute the absolute value, the expectation of absolute value of a Hessian for, an, for a random matrix. So that's the dictionary. The absolute value is, of course, the pain. If you can get rid of it, that would be easier. So anyway, that's what you have to compute. In this case, surprise, because the model is isotropic, this thing has something to do with the GOE, right? So it is, in fact, a shifted GOE. So then you have all the tools you want in the world to study this thing, all right? So when you do that, so this is the isotropy. So this thing, this Hessian is, in fact, a, a, a shifted GOE. The shift is related to the value U. And then from there, you can compute. So the theorem, which is due to, uh, in this paper by uh, Ofinger, myself, and Cherny in 2013, gives the, uh, these annuals, esti this, this estimate. Essentially, so we take B to be negative infinity U. Oh, right, so. 
So this is the number of critical points of index k below the level u, and this limit exists as a certain function, which uh, let's call it theta k of u, which of course depends on so on u and the mixture. All right, and and this this guy is explicit. I won't go there. You obtain that through large deviation result for the for the edge eigenvalues and the bulk, in fact, for and all that were known by former work of Alice Guillonet and myself, and Alice Guillonet and Mirdembo and myself, so that's easy. You put all that together, you get this, all right? So this tells you, so in the case of the pure p-spin, let me explain what happened. What you find very quickly is this picture. So if I, I draw the picture here of the k equals zero, right? k equals zero corresponds to, I draw the complexity, U is increasing like this, so high energies are in this direction. And k equals zero corresponds to minima, and the complexity does something like this. Okay, that's all an old story. So that's theta zero, in the case of the pure p-spin. So it tells you in particular that below a certain level that I will call my negative E zero, this complexity is negative, right? This theta zero is negative which means that the, the, the mean number is exponentially small. So the probability to find a critical point before the, below this is tiny. Right? So this tells you that the ground state has to be, which is a local minimum, has to be on the right of this. Right? And then there is another value here that we call negative infinity for whatever reason, which is also well known in physics, above which this becomes flat which means this was cumulative, remember? So this means that above this, you have no local minima. In fact, the probability to find a local minimum above that is exponential minus n squared, so very, very small. So you, this tells you that if you draw a picture, if the energy is like this, you have this thing here, this thing here, the typical value is at zero, because the mean, I mean the typical fluctuation are order square root n, right, because the variance is n, Right? And here the extremes are of order n, and all the critical points of finite index are in this band. You have very many critical points above this, but of diverging index. Okay, in particular, all local minima are here. All right, so that's the story, very easy. In fact, you can prove something more if theta one is like this. So saddle points of index one are less numerous, exponentially less. So in this region, every critical point is essentially a local minimum, okay? More than that now, you have, uh, you could guess, so the real question here is, is this thing, it seems natural to guess, if I call ground state, this would be the minimum of the energy on the sphere, and then, uh, so it's natural to guess that the ground state divided by n converges to something, that's easy, that it converges, let me call that gs infinity, and that this thing should be negative e0. Right? What we know is that this guy should be above negative e0. Right? But then, there's a very easy thing to say then, to renounce the principles I, I stated at the beginning. Okay, we can have a look at what Parisi did. Right? So you look at the free energy, which I don't want to touch here. Using Parisi, you can see, you can compute the free energy, because in this phase it's one RSB, you can compute it. You can let the temperature go to zero. This gives you the ground state, and you find that these two guys are the same. Okay, so it's, this is correct. But it's a stupid proof, because I'm using Parisi. So then the question came, I don't want to use Parisi, I want to ignore Parisi. Uh, Giorgio is a friend, so he, he's heard me say that. No. So I want to do it without this. So the natural thing is to compute a second moment method. So can you control the second moment of this? If you can, so if you can control the second moment, then you have a chance to do this. But as, as I said, you have a catch rise formula for a second moment. The Katz-Rice formula involves, is very similar to this, but except for the second moment, now it involves two critical points. So it involves two random matrices, which are two GOEs, but which are correlated. 
So you have to fight the correlation, and it's a very serious mess. So of course, and I was completely sure when, we started, when I started this, that it would be, you would have to do a modified second moment method. So then, of course, I asked Ofer Zeytouni, who was the master of this. Then Ofer asked the student, and that was Eliran Subag. And we all told him, that's easy, just do this. It, if you read his paper, it's a masterpiece. It's really a terrible computer, I mean, fantastic computation. <laughs> and he did, he proved that this behaves essentially like the square of the first moment. So Subak did this in 15. So in particular, it proved that the limit, that, that this limit here is in fact quenched, right? If you control the second moment, you can do that. So that the, if you look at the limit of one over n log of crit, so it didn't, it, it didn't do it for fixed index, it was for the whole thing. When u is low enough, lower than this number, then this is exactly what we, what is called over there. It did that for the pure p spin. So once you have this second moment computation, then you know, for instance, you, for instance, you know that directly. You don't need to have the Parisi formula, right? Because then you know that, so then you can become more ambitious. Then you can say, can we describe now the Gibbs measure. So, okay, maybe you can. So before that, what they, what they, what they did with Subag and Zaytuni in, in Subag's thesis, they looked at the extreme points, right? You can look at the lowest point, lowest critical point, right? They are all very near this. So they prove first that the extremal process, if you look at the deepest points, the deepest min local minima converges to a, which is very natural, in the case of a pure p spin to a Gumbel distribution, the point process. So what does that mean? That means that the very deep points tend to behave as if they were the extreme values of an of a, of a independent field, right? And that's natural because these very deep points are in fact orthogonal, kind of almost orthogonal. When they are very almost orthogonal, the correlation, which is given here, is zero, right? So it doesn't mean that this is easy to prove, but that's what's behind this. And once you have this, you have the description of the Gibbs measure. And that was done, so this was done by uh, Zaytuni, Subag and Zaytuni, I think, in 16. And then you had a description by Subag in 16 of the Gibbs measure. How many points you there? Finite, 17. Right? which is my number for large, but not depending on n. Right? <laughs> so, what? I'm sorry? A small infinity is 17, right? That's, uh, so in fact, you can prove more than that. You have this, saying that it's Gumbel, for instance, it tells you the following. If you classify those points by the deepest, the second deepest, the third deepest, you look at their Gibbs mass now, Right, which is just this exponential, the Hamilton divided by the total, then of course it converges to a Poisson Dirichlet process, like it should, because we are in one RSB thing. Okay? The, so, anyway, the Gibbs measure here is described precisely as I just said. So, Subag obtained this description very precisely. So, let me explain what the problem seems to be. Here you have local minima. Let me draw wells. Okay? That's on the sphere, of course. And so you have 17 ones that are very, very low. But in this whole band, you have an exponentially large number of them, right? as this tells you. So where, is, where are the tap states? Where is the Gibbs measure concentrated? If you fix a low enough temperature, it's the same as fixing a low enough energy. And so now the Gibbs measure is supposed to be concentrated at this level. So it could be concentrated in this well, or in this well, or in that well, right? The, the bottom of the well is not clear, right? So you have one parameter which seems free, okay? So which one is it? So the answer is that the Gibbs measure decomposes here into thin, uh, measures on thin bands, the tap states, if you want, 
which are all concentrated on the deepest points, okay, for low temperature. So that means that the Gibbs measure at one, one level is here. I have my 17 points. If I take another level here, it will be like that. So if I draw a picture, if this is the sphere in n dimension, which of course it is not, um, if this is the deepest point, the second deepest point, the third deepest point, the fourth deepest point, then you have around them a sphere of dimension n minus one less, n minus two, a tiny band, and the Gibbs measure is concentrated on those tiny bands. So that's really the, so this is of course the one RSB decomposition. So to come back to what you were saying, now if you take a point at random under the Gibbs measure, then they may fall into the same, then their overlap will not be uh, zero, or they may fall into different and then they will be zero because these guys are orthogonal. Okay, so that's a very, very precise description. And so, the re so this is a very serious paper. Let me explain very quickly what happens. Very naive. You know now the bottom of this. You know you have a critical point. So what do you do? You do a harmonic, I mean, a Taylor expansion degree two. Right, so you under, because you understand the Hessian, because that's what leads this computation. So you understand the Hessian. So you understand the curvature of this well. You do a Taylor expansion. You, show, you prove that at low enough temperature, the third order term doesn't count. And then you're left with a problem in dimension one less, which is still a sphere, right? Uh, and now you look at the spin glass model that this induces, this quadratic spin glass, a trivial spin glass. It's Sherrington Kirkpatrick spherical, which means very simple. And you realize that it's, a, as, as was said already, I, I don't know if it was Elvin or Francesco, that it is at high temperature. So because this one is at high temperature, what you need are just very precise results on random matrices which were available by work of Jin Ho Bike. So when you do that, you get this, the fact that this is really completely at high temperature and this is, so these are the pure states, okay? No tap, no nothing, no replica, just geometry. But here you see that you can do the state following I was talking about. The Gibbs measure at one temperature at another temperature are just in the same wells, right? By the way, what ha this is completely unjust to all the other local minima. They play no role, right? In fact, they do play a role, and that proves that the, that the, uh, that the Parisi picture, and, and of course, this is well known in the physics community, is not complete. Because in fact, there is another energy here. Temperature corresponding to energies below that are one RSB. The transition, the Parisi transition, the, the one that we are hearing, happens here. But still, here, the Gibbs measure is very far from being paramagnetic. Here, the Gibbs measure is also made of a lot of little rings like this. But now, instead of being rings centered on the very bottom ones, they are centered at, at a depth which is here. So you have here, you are somewhere there. So you have exponentially many of them. So the Gibbs measure, if you look at it like Parisi, if you look at the, repli so it's replica symmetric because it's made of all uh, very many so small things like this. If you pick one point, at two point at random, they will never fall into the same because the mass of each of them is exponentially small. So they will fall in two of them and they will be orthogonal. So the order parameter is not a, a good order parameter. The distribution of the, of the overlap is, doesn't tell you the story. The story here, the measure here is very, this phase is very important. The Gibbs measure is certainly not paramagnetic. And that explains why this guy is what the physicists call the dynamic transition. Because now if you do dynamics and you start from a random point, your, your dynamics will stop here. Why? Because this phase here the spinnable phase is full of, is rough. You have plenty of holes and barriers. So the time to go down in, in this 
becomes exponentially large. So this has been proven in another paper by Jagannath and myself, where we study the spectral gap. And the spectral gap is exponentially large, is exponentially small here. So the mixing time is exponentially large here. Right? So these other critical points still have a role, but not in this uh, low phase. All right, so that's, that's the, um, uh, the pure case. What about the mixed case? So in the mixed case, so let me explain in quickly what happened in this long paper with Ofer and Eliran. So now you take the mixed case. Right, so remember, that was the mixed case. And there, we wanted to see the chaos happening. The pure p-spin is singular. So first, of course, you have to be a little careful because mixed case, as I said, can have two RSB, full RSB. So we have a condition that, uh, if I have time, I will describe under a certain condition that we call M, like mixed. Okay, that I will describe. This condition implies one RSB and is, for, is open and is satisfied, for instance, by, by tiny perturbation of your pure P-spin. So you take a pure three spin, you perturb it a little bit by a four spin, then condition M is satisfied. And we will see that under this condition, the structure is different, and in particular that we have chaos. So you don't have chaos for the pure three spin, but you have, a, you have chaos for the pure three plus a little bit of four, okay? So I will describe what that is. It's also related, this condition is related to the um, second moment computation I'm giving over there. It's related to this complexity computation. So the real idea that came from this work of uh, Eliran, which is uh, beautiful, is that in fact, you should not look at the critical points of the Hamiltonian. You should, uh, on, the, on the sphere. The important thing is to look at the critical points of the Hamiltonian on the ball. Okay? Why? Because that corresponds to the tap construction. In this case, the tap functional is defined, the tap free energy is defined on the whole ball, not on the sphere. And so you look at critical points of this guy, you find one, let's say here, then let's say here, it will be better. Then you construct with this the, the ring, which is defined by this, right? So you take the orthogonal thing, defines a circle on this, that will be the ring, okay? Then you try to count this number of critical points, but to do that, you have to count not only the critical points with the, fixing their value, but fixing also their normal derivative. So it's a harder computation of complexity. So you compute the complexity as I did, as I explained before, with fixed adding normal derivative, radial derivative, I should say. So this is, again, a problem that transforms into a random matrix problem. And then you do the second moment computation, which is even more, worse. And for that, you need the condition M to say that the second moment condition will be good. And with all that, you can do the same thing. And let me just give the picture. What you find is first that the Gibbs measure, so first you prove here, again, that the ground state converges to this threshold defined by complexity. So the threshold of complexity is the ground state. Then you prove that the Gibbs measure decomposes, again, into pure states. And this pure states are, have a, the number is now not 17, it's sub-exponential, right? So it doesn't grow, uh, when you take the log of this number divided by n, it goes to zero. So it could be 17, but uh, I don't know what it is really. And what are those pure states which are orthogonal? So the states are, so let me describe very briefly, but let's say in words, 
These pure states, these critical points in the, in the ball, with, are in fact close to these low energy critical points for the Hamiltonian and the sphere. But they are not there yet, really. If you take a critical point at low energy on the sphere, it will be here. In the pure case, there's a path that goes from the center to there, which is purely a radial. That's why it's singular. In a mixed case, you have a path of those critical points inside that go there, which is something like this. Right? So you have a path that you can follow. So the state following is different. And now, these critical points with these rings, so you have again the decomposition of the uh, Gibbs measure into rings, tap states, which are pure orthogonal, they completely change with temperature. They're not at all the same. Right? So you have temperature chaos. And in particular, in terms of algorithms, this means something, because it means that you cannot do what is called state following. Right? So the structure is completely different. You cannot, if you know the state at a temperature, you know nothing at a different temperature. There's no way of decomposing this? No. no. That's what's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I, at least I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, it's fundamentally different. Yeah. It's fundamentally different. And the singularity is this. This path uh, sticks suddenly to a line. And when you're on the line, nothing happens. And I will stop here. Question or remark. I mean, you said, well, I mean, so uh, you were saying that you look at the spectral gap for this dynamical issue. Oh, yeah. And if I remember correctly, I mean, there is some problem with uh, that here uh, because once for the rem. Yes, that's true. And it doesn't really give you the right uh, somehow behavior in a way. So can you also? You know, look, uh, okay, so that's, that's a different question. So let me. Let, so in fact, it's true. The only when we did this thing. OK, so that's a loaded question, because we, 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 we worked together for years on the long time dynamics of, uh, of spin glasses. And you know there are plenty of time regimes which are exponential in n, and all sorts of things like aging happen. But we, and, and, then, and in fact, we started with uh, Veronique and, and Anton by the longest of those time scales, those just before equilibration for the REN, in a simple case. But then I realized that, in fact, a few, I mean, just a few years back, two years ago or something, or three years ago, that there was no mathematical proof of, of uh, a study of the spectral gap, which is, seems to be a simpler question than, uh, than, uh, than this. So we did that with Okosh, and we have a criterion that gives us exponentially long mixing time. And this criterion, in fact, we rediscovered. It's based on a deep result by Penchenko on large deviation of the overlap. And we rediscovered, without knowing it, what the physicists call the friends parisi potential. So there is one thing which is called the friends parisi potential. And, when it, and by the way, when we looked at that, the only paper that we found in mathematics that was rigorous before that, essentially there were two, one by Mathieu, Pierre, who is somewhere here, and the other by, by the other Pierre, by Pierre Picot. So it was a Marseille thing. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, um, and in our case, so we have this sufficient condition about the, uh, this friends parisi potential. It has to have a bump, a, a barrier in free energy, everybody would say. And this implies uh, uh, exponentially large spin uh, spectral gap. But it's not, what we find is not the last word. When you present, so when I sent this to physicists, they told me, oh, it looks like friends parisi potential. Of course, I sent it to friends and parisi. So they were nice. <laughs> but, but in fact, the one where we have found, there is room there to improve. And this is related to the question that you're asking. What we found was what we thought it was quenched, completely quenched. But they say it's the anneal friends parisi potential. And the, 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 the optimal answer, if you believe the physicist, is when you take the quench friends parisi potential. So tell me, let me tell you what it is. The, 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 what we call the, uh, so the anneal French parisi potential is you take two replica under the Gibbs measure and you look at the large deviation of, of their overlap. The large deviation functional of this is the, what they call the anneal French parisi potential. And there is nothing annealed in it. I just took two replica. But what they call the quench is you fix one replica and you just, you just look at, in fact, one is fixed and you, and, and you just take the other one moving. So this one we didn't do, we, we, don't, we, we didn't try. And so in order to really feel, if you believe them, in order to really feel this transition, you need to have the quenched friends parisi potential. 
By the way, the paper I just mentioned is not with uh, Subag, it's with Okosh Jagannath, who, who has been mentioned a few times. A nice question. Uh, going from the surface to the ball, I did not understand. Are you, in effect, uh, taking into account also the entropy of the states? I mean, is it of, of the course, states the entropy that you're looking at rather than configurations? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so let me explain what that is. The, at least in the usual words of, of uh, this, wor this word, the tap function, the tap free, there is, so Erwin was explaining the tap equations, right? They are supposed to be the critical points of some free energy. As I explained, this free energy is introduced by, by Bray Moore, introducing this Onzager correction at very high temperature. This gives you something that you believe uh, lives in the space of free energy, so the, the, the critical points, the minima, are supposed to be the states, right? And so the problem is that it's not very clear what the, how you should define this free energy, and there are different definitions. And as I said, Penchenko and Subag seem to have now the right way to do it using this approach. For, for easing spins. But in, in the context of spherical spins, it's much easier because the tab free energy is supposed to be the Hamiltonian itself plus a function of the radius. It's the, defined it's in the, the ball. The, the, that has to do with the entropy. Of yes, the yes, state. of course. And here the state is the ring. Absolutely. You're going from the energy to the free energy when you go in there, so you add entropy. <laughs> but the thing is that in the spherical case, the only difference is a function of the radius. So in fact, what this questions and complexity on the pure p-spin, for instance, had been computed by physicists before with their methods, but they didn't compute, they computed the complexity of the tap free energy, which is of course a very related problem because there's just one variable difference. So what we do here is directly look at the ball, which is in fact the tap uh, thing. So, so here a simplifying feature is that you can identify the extremal state those yes, the yes, sphere, yes. But the actual state is a ring. Yeah. I mean, this relation is simple. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we do have a hard cutoff for lunch, so let's thank all of our speakers for the session.